<clears throat> okay. Recording is on. Welcome back, everyone, to BC 212, uh, second lecture on Christian apologetics. Today we are we've been focusing on the person of Christ, and we've been uh, at towards the end of the last lecture. Uh, we've been looking at the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. Just looking at it very uh, practically and saying, can we, in a very practical manner, establish evidence for the resurrection of Jesus? So the first thing we mentioned was that the Roman seal was broken. Uh, and... Uh, so that took place, the Roman seal was broken, of which we are saying could not have uh, happened, just the disciples could not have done it, they would not have done it, they, too scared, they were too scared at that time. Secondly, we are saying that the empty tomb was right there in Jerusalem. So there could be no foul play. There could be no game that the disciples were playing. You know, they could, if in case, in case, they said, "Oh, we took the body far away, someplace to bury it." And that time, the body, after three days, the body rose up, and now that tomb is empty. It's way away there. Nobody, you know, if people were not able to go and verify it, then it could be a big question mark. But the fact is, the empty tomb was in Jerusalem. It belonged to a, a person. Everything was very clear. So there was no foul play involved. And added to that, what we are saying is that there were historical sources, Jewish and Roman historians, who have recorded about this empty tomb in Jerusalem. Uh, and this is coming from sources that are not Christian. So the, we, there's not the believers recording. This is others who are recording and saying the tomb was empty. Right? So we looked at these two. Let's move forward. We Let me share the notes. And we will move forward. Okay. Number three. We are seeing the next piece of evidence, which is, there was a large stone that was placed in front of the tomb. And, and you know, some estimate, I mean, it's not obviously something that is recorded for us, but they estimate that the, 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 stone, the, the, the stone that was sealed, that sealed the tomb would have been, very heavy, and this was pushed up the hill, away from, you know, to open the tomb, and this was not an easy job. So, if the disciples, the disciples of Jesus, were up to tricks, and they wanted to steal the body, hide it somewhere else, and then say that Jesus rose from dead, well, think about this. They had to get past the soldiers. They had to open this heavy tomb. Uh, they had to push this heavy tombstone up. They, they, of course, they had to break the Roman seal, as we said earlier. And then they had to push this heavy stone up in order to steal the body. If that was what something people say was done. But... That would not have been possible because you've got the guards there, you've got the Roman seal there, and then you've got this heavy stone that was pushed uphill in order to open the tomb. So practically, you, you know, the sepulchre, the stone would have moved, been pushed down, but it's pushed the other way. And uh, it's not possible to do all of that and steal the body. So. The tomb was open, the stone was rolled of, up the hill. Their guards were there. 
So the fact that the stone was moved away, moved uphill, is also a very important point to consider. How could, if the disciples had to steal the body, how could they have done it? How could they have moved the stone without making any noise? How could that have happened? A fourth point to consider is the Roman guards were not just, you know, at that place, but when they found out that something had happened, they fled in terror. That means they left the place totally scared. Something beyond their control had taken place. And they went straight to the Jewish priests and told them what had happened. So the fact that they uh, were so afraid that they left their place of assignment tells us that something unusual had happened. You know, if the so if the disciples of Jesus came to steal the body, these guards would have chased them off, maybe even killed all of them. So that there was no such kind of an encounter. But something happened that made these guards, Roman soldiers, so scared, so scared. Something overwhelming, something very powerful that happened, made them scared. They left their place of duty, which simply meant they they would face death penalty. You know, possible they, they would be killed for leaving their place of duty. And they went to the priests and told them whatever happened. So you can imagine the soldiers, they, 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 they would have gone to the priest and said, you know, there's the, the something just beyond us, something supernatural happened. And I, we don't know exactly what they experienced, whether they saw the powerful angel of God come to open the tomb, whether there was, you know, uh, overwhelming presence of God upon them. I, I, we don't know. But something just beyond their control. And so they would have gone and uh, probably even not have had words to describe to the, the high priest and, you know, what had happened, saying that this, you know, something just made us of, you know, overpowered us. We could not do anything. The stone was moved out of the way and the body has disappeared. We don't know, right? So, the Roman soldiers left their place of duty, risking that they would be put to death, went and reported it to the Jewish elders. Now, of course, the uh, uh, the the high priests just told them to lie about it. Just say that, uh, you know, the disciples of Jesus came and stole their body. They gave them money to tell a lie. And just they said, okay, don't worry about you. You you go, we'll take care of it. In other words, the high priest said, Look, you're not going to be put to death for this. Meaning they are going to go and pacify the Roman government, take care of it. And they just said, You just go and tell a lie. Just say the disciples of Jesus. Came and stole the body. But see the whole sequence of events. The soldiers were overpowered. They left their place of duty and they went to the chief priest who had requested that to be posted there. Right. And um, so, this again is another indicator here that the fact that the Roman soldiers would leave their place meant that they were overpowered by something. They didn't have to fight the disciples, they were overpowered and they left in fear. They left the place of duty. A few more things that we can look at is the grave clothes of Jesus were left behind. That means the, the cloth in which the whole body was wrapped, head to, to head to foot, the whole body was wrapped. That was left behind. His faith face cloth, the cloth 
that covered his face was folded and kept. Now you think about this. It's if somebody had come to steal the body, they would have taken everything. You know, if the body was physically carried out of the tomb, you know, they would not spend time trying to, you know, uh, wrap the uh, fold the face cloth, and they would not spend time to try to take out the uh, the cloth that uh, that surrounded his body. They would take everything and leave if they came to steal the body. But amazingly, the body is not there. But the cloth that wrapped the body and was used for the body, everything is left behind. That is strange. Because when John comes in, he sees, and he sees the grave clothes. And it could have been most likely like a cocoon, because by the time three days over, uh, the, 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 like I said, the, the embalming, the, the spices, things that they were put on the cloth may have hardened to some extent. So it could have been just like a cocoon lying there, but there's no body. So that's another key, that it could not have been stolen, because if somebody came to steal the body, they would take everything and go quickly, run, you know. But the clothes were left behind. And number six, the resurrected Christ appeared to many people. So Jesus rose up from the dead. For the next 40 days, he appeared to many witnesses. And now when you look at the witnesses, who are the people who saw Jesus? One is there was uh, 500 of his own disciples. 500 people who saw Jesus. If there were 500 people, so remember, it, we're not talking about five people. We're not talking about 50 people. We're talking about 500 people. And Paul writes about this in 1 Corinthians 15, that there, he was seen by more than 500 people, more than 500. So, you know, it could be a number bigger than five. Uh, it definitely is a number bigger than 500. But if you had 500 people see something, then you've got a lot of witnesses to say that this was true. It's not five or not 50, but 500, more than 500 people. So that's the first thing. Secondly, Among all the witnesses, there were hostile witnesses. That means there were people who were not in favor of Jesus, and yet they witnessed the resurrected Christ. Most notably was Saul of Tarsus. Now, of course, Saul of Tarsus, his account of Jesus happened maybe uh, eight plus years after the physical resurrection. But his encounter with Jesus, is, it's, it's a huge, it's a big indicator of the resurrection of Christ. Meaning, Christ showed himself alive for 40 days after his crucifixion and resurrection. He showed himself alive for 40 days to about 500 witnesses, and then he ascended to heaven. The Christian faith was born. People said, we believe in Jesus. We have seen the resurrected Christ. Um, on the day of Pentecost, there was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The church was established. Work was happening in Jerusalem. Now, about eight years later, there is a man called Saul of Tarsus. Um, he's a Pharisee. Uh, he does not like this message and the preaching about Jesus. He is going to go and try and destroy those people who are following Christ. And he says he has an encounter with Jesus Christ. So he's a hostile witness. And his whole life has changed in one day. In the morning, he began as a, a opposer of Christ and a persecutor of the believers. By the evening of the same day, he's a follower of Christ and a professor. He's professing faith in Christ. Same day. What happened? 
he encountered the risen Christ. In what way? In a very powerful way. He saw, I mean, he heard the voice, he encountered Christ in a very powerful way. And that was, that's a very powerful testimony that Christ had indeed raised from the dead. Another set of hostile witnesses for Christ's own family members. So other than his mother Mary, Christ's own brothers did not believe in him during his earthly ministry. Right? So you we read about this in John 7, verse 5, that even his brothers did not believe in him. His own brothers didn't believe in Jesus during his earthly ministry. Now, the brothers, they saw Jesus being crucified. They saw him nailed to the cross. They must have been wondering, oh, it's really sad. This has happened to him. Our own brother, his half-brother, has been crucified. Uh, he should not have done what he did. You know, maybe he was cheating the people, whatever. Because they didn't believe him during the earthly ministry. But then, a few days later, these brothers are sitting in the upper room. Mary, the mother of Jesus, is sitting with his brothers, the brothers of Jesus. They're all waiting in the upper room and they're, going, they're in prayer and supplication. So what happened between the cross and the upper room? Well, it was the resurrection of Jesus. So these brothers who did not believe in him during his earthly ministry, after his crucifixion, they believed and they are sitting in the upper room waiting for the Holy Spirit. What happened? The resurrection. That means the brothers, Mary and the brothers, the brothers of Jesus, the, especially the brothers of Jesus, would have witnessed the resurrected Christ. And they would have been among these 500 witnesses who saw the risen Christ. And so now they are sitting in the upper room waiting for the Holy Spirit. And these are hostile witnesses because they did not believe in Christ before. So when you when we put all of this uh, you know, all this information together, and just two more points here. Um, the disciples' own lives, you know, the 12 disciples, of course, uh, we know that uh, Judas Iscariot was replaced in the 12. But these 12 disciples who had known Jesus Christ personally, after the resurrection, they gave their lives for what they believed. If Christ had died and not risen from the dead, they would not have subsequently done what they did. I mean, what would they go and preach? Because they were ready to quit. They were ready to. They were dispersed. They were ready to, you know, go 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 to something else. But disciples gave their lives for the message they preached. They were all martyred. Other than John the apostle, John the beloved, they're all martyred. And fact number eight is that even today, in the name of Jesus. Lives are changed and miracles happen. So, how can we say that Jesus Christ rose from the dead? Well, when you look at the facts surrounding his resurrection, uh, all of these are not, you know, all of these are telling us that, look, there is no way the disciples could have stolen the body. There is no way anybody else could have stolen the body. There is no way that Jesus. Uh, you know, didn't die on the cross. He died physically on the cross. That's why he was buried in the tomb and the soldiers were standing there in front of that tomb. Um, there's no way that uh, there was any makeup of the story. Everything is telling us he had to have died. The resurrection had to be so supernatural, so powerful. 
and he was seen the resurrected Christ was seen by uh, more than 500 people and if you had more than five, if you have more than 500 eyewitnesses to this uh, it's beyond a doubt that he did rise from the dead so when somebody asks us um, you know sorry when, when somebody asks us about the resurrection of Christ how can we prove or how can we yes we believe by faith we believe but from a practical evidence how can we prove that Christ indeed rose from the dead these are things we can point to and say you know just think about all of these uh, these are clearly indicating to us that Jesus Christ was buried and that he physically rose from the dead and there is no way uh, it is a made-up story there's no way that this could be uh, uh, something that was uh, uh, made up or created by the disciples okay any any questions any thoughts on this on the resurrection of Christ Everybody with me so far? Okay. We'll just do one more short lesson and uh, then we will uh, close for today. Uh, the next part is a very short lesson about Christ himself. So first we said we talked about the uniqueness of Christ. We talked about the resurrection of Christ. Now uh, what the short lesson is simply about salvation in Christ. This is something we all know. I'm just going to just quickly review it, uh, and then we will stop. Uh, it, it's a little early, but we will we'll pick up the rest. Um, sorry, I need to. Let me just pause here. I need to open up that PDF. Yeah. Okay. There. Hmm. What happened? Mm -hmm. It's not letting me. Okay. All right, got it now. All right, um, I will put this up. Uh, lesson twelve, I think I have. I didn't put up in the classroom. I will put it. So this is a short lesson, but what we want to emphasize in this lesson is that Jesus is the only way to salvation. Now, why do I have this? But when we look at the Christian world, uh, today uh, people are afraid to say this, that Jesus is the only way to salvation. Today, in a world where there is pluralism and relativism, pluralism means people accept more than one so they say yeah, yeah 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 there's more than one way to salvation there's more than one way to god that's pluralism and relativism is everything is relative there's not there's nothing black and white there's no truth everything is gray you do whatever you want so in a world where um or uh, we would say, you know, a pluralistic society, a society that just embraces everything, or a, a society where relativism is embraced. It means, you know, you, truth is whatever you make it to be. What, what you say is right for you, what I say is right for me. You know, we all live happily like that. 
in a world like that, to say Jesus Christ is the only way to salvation is a very difficult thing. But we need to, we need to be very clear of what the Bible says and what we are going to say. So if somebody asks you, you know, do you say Jesus Christ is the only way to salvation? Our answer is yes. Why do you say that? Well, for these reasons. Number one, the Word of God clearly states this. Right? And we have looked at all of these scriptures. We've considered these scriptures before. The Word of God is very clear that Jesus Christ is the only way to salvation. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Acts 4, 12, the Bible says, there is no salvation in anybody else except in Christ. 1 Timothy 2, 5 and 6, there's one God, one mediator between God and man. 1 John 5, 11 and 12, if you have the Son, you have life. If you do not have the Son of God, you do not have life. Very clear. So the Bible is very clearly stating this. Second, why do we say there's salvation only in Jesus? Because there's nobody else like Jesus. We already established the uniqueness of Jesus. Nobody else matches to Christ. You know, if there were three other people who matched up exactly to Christ, we would say, okay, there's salvation in, you know, any one of them. But there's nobody else like that. Christ is absolutely unique. That's why we say the salvation only through Christ. Uh, thirdly, because it's only Jesus Christ who prov provides a complete remedy for sin and the promise of relationship with God. Nobody else is saying, look, I can provide you uh, the cleansing for your sin and bring you into you know, a right relationship with God. There's no one else who brings that message or who provides that for us. So we therefore say, look, Jesus is the only one who does this for us. Christ came into the world to save sinners. So we, we say salvation is only through Jesus Christ and salvation is received by grace through faith. So it's not like we have to go and earn our salvation. It's provided freely through the person of Christ and we receive by grace through faith in Christ. We are not saved by following religious laws. Uh, we, are, we, don't, we don't go through those cycles of birth and rebirth and reincarnation and so on. Uh, we're not going to be saved by somebody else's good deeds, but it's just through faith in Christ and we need to repent and believe in Jesus Christ. So uh, I just wanted to make this very clear uh, because in today's Christian world, there are people who would not, uh, who, who, who compromise on this part. Uh, they would do not say, oh, salvation is only through Jesus, you know, uh, but we need to be very clear. The Bible teaches, this is what the Bible teaches, and this is what we will state, that salvation is only through the person of Jesus Christ. Okay? So, uh, we will pause here for today, and next week, what we're going to do is, um, uh, and I will share the lessons, we're going to talk about how to share Christ with somebody from the Hindu faith and somebody from the Muslim faith. How do we share Christ with them? And basically to understand, uh, 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 how do we help them see the difference? Now, with people from the Christian faith, uh, the Hindu faith, it's very difficult because uh, Hinduism, generally, they like just accept everything, right? Because by nature, there is uh, many, there are many gods and goddesses, and you know, they they will just yeah, Jesus, one of the gods. So, but then we don't want Jesus to be one of the main gods because he's not; he's unique. How do we help them see that? And then people with from the Muslim faith. There are different challenges uh, for them to embrace Jesus Christ. Uh, we need to understand what are those challenges and how do we present Christ to a Muslim so that a Muslim can see the difference and be willing to receive Christ. Okay, so that's what we will cover.
uh, next week uh, and going forward. Let's take some time for questions. Rosalind, uh, uh, is gospel tract distribution on the streets a wise thing to do now? Considering the situation around us, not so pleasant, is there a way that we can help someone who wants to distribute tracts on the streets? Now, um, so, you know, uh, here, especially in India, uh, there is, uh, you know, in many, many states, we have these anti-conversion laws, and um, there's, um, there, there are, there's, um, people are hostile. So, we'll have to take it place by place, city by city, right? And also, how and what we distribute. For example, if we distribute something that's you know that is not directly in the face telling people um, you have to believe in Jesus and Jesus is the only way and if you don't believe in Jesus you'll go to hell, you know. So, see, if you have a tract, a tract that says you know God is a good God, or you know don't lose hope, or uh, uh, something very general, you know. That can and of course in the mess inside the message you slowly communicate about Christ. That I, you know if you just give it uh, uh, stand and give it out in certain areas, it's not a problem at all. Uh, so for example, when we uh, what we distribute, like uh, we you know we go to colleges, uh, inside colleges, of course we get permission. We put up posters uh, on generic generic things uh, like on our sermon series. For example, recently, along our Bible college students and others um, uh, in Bangalore, uh, we put out posters and also we gave out small handouts just at Faith and Science and gave a link to our website. Uh, so that's a very general thing. That's like, hey, what is this Faith and Science? And now we're doing a new sermon series on my mind. So it'll just say my mind and links to our website. So we'll see like my mind and they say, okay, what is this? And we gave it to restaurants. Restaurants will you know put it out as a as coasters. We gave it to uh, we gave posters to uh, in uh, certain colleges to put up on their notice board. So, so people are kind of open because they're very generic. Uh, it's not like straight in your face uh, saying something like uh, you have to believe in Jesus or something. No, it's very generic. It's it's actually a sermon series, and it links to our website. And in the website, of course, there will be a lot of content that uh, that's pointing them to the Word of God and so on. So that way, we un we won't face problems because uh, we are just giving some, like anybody else, we're giving some handout. So that's one thing uh, I would say. You know, like. It, Instead of instead of giving out a gospel tract that says if you don't believe in Jesus you will go to hell, if you give something like that, you know, or something very direct, it it will anger people, and and the current situation is very difficult here, so we have to be a little careful. So give something generic that points them to a place where they will get more specific content, then from there they can you know uh, make their journey. So that's one option we can consider. Uh, second option I also would recommend is to think about using online promotions. So we also run um, uh, a small face, you know. So you, you make a post on Facebook uh, that's again very generic, and then you promote it in your city, right? So uh, what, what happens uh, is that this Facebook ad. Uh, is then presented to people in a very uh, non-threatening way. You know, uh, it's it's presented to people when they are you know scrolling their through their Facebook wall and in the ad or whatever they're doing on Facebook, the ad comes up. You can target this ad to, they say, people in a certain city, people with certain demographics. You can target the ad. It's, it doesn't cost much. So in Indian rupees, you know, we would spend 10,000, 20,000 rupees. Um, and you can reach close to um, half a million people. So uh, I can just quickly show you, if you just give me a moment.
So you can see this is our uh, APCW Facebook page. So we were running a promo. This is a fa on Facebook. Uh, it's called Faith and Science. So you see the post. It's very simple. It just says Faith and Science. And then the link, this goes to the web page, which will give them a lot of information, invite them to service, and so on. And we ran this ad. So you see uh, how many people we reached. We reached more than half a million people, 540,029 pe people. Uh, 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 there were 22,000 engagements. That means 22,000 or almost 23,000 people paused to see it. Uh, and uh, and then there are about 20,000 link clicks. That means uh, 20,000 or 21 some thousand people actually clicked on this ad. That means they went to our website. And this this we just spent, I think we spent only uh, 10 or 20,000 rupees, let me tell you. Yeah, so yeah, this ad, we spent 20,000 rupees. So we spent 20,000 rupees. It covered two cities, Bangalore and Mangalore. Um, it, uh, it ran for a, a, almost 30 days. And this is the result. So you think about this. For 20,000 rupees, we reached ha more than you know, half a million people. And uh, you know, about 20,000 plus people clicked on it to go and see what it's about. So I would encourage you know uh, using this kind of promotion where uh, it's it's very quiet. It's happening all the time, twenty four seven. Where whenever people are online, the ad is being presented. They get to go to the website. The website has a lot more content than you know that can be given in a in a gospel tract, and. Uh, you know, they can explore the website, they can see a lot of things about the church, where the church location is, they can listen to sermons, so many things. And it only costs us 20,000 rupees. Uh, if you think about printing the gospel tracts and all, you know, it, it's a lot more money. Each gospel tract may be at least five rupees, 10 rupees to print, um, or five rupees maybe. Um, and then somebody has to physically, you know, if you had to give out a gospel tract physically, how many can a person give? But imagine 500,000 plus people or impressions were made and 20,000 people clicked on it and went to see what it's about. Uh, so I would suggest that using social media, and this is just one example, using social media we can get the word across uh, faster, more widely, uh, targeted, and also give your people opportunity to um, engage a lot more uh, with whatever content we have. Now, of course, just like in track distribution, not everybody who gets a tract are going to get saved or will come to church. You know, it's not that. So even here, even the 20,000 people, some of them may just be watching quietly online. Some of them may be, you know, checking out more and more in the website. What is all this about? So people will have will take different paths in the journey. Not all of them will come to church right away, but we are doing our part to reach out. I hope that helps, uh, Rosalyn. Okay. Um, any other questions before we? Close in prayer. Okay, so we'll pause here for today. Uh, next week, we will deal with the aspect of how to present Christ to people of different faith. And uh, yeah, so we will spend some time on that next week. Okay, can uh, I request somebody just to? Pray with the class and then we will dismiss. Anyone can pray, please. Father, we thank you for uh, this time. Thank you for helping us to learn more about you, your uniqueness. And we pray, Lord Jesus, as we continue to uh, live this journey, 
help us to be uh, ready to give answers and also to strengthen our faith in you lord jesus help us to give you our utmost importance in every area of our life and to be so strong in the faith that you are our god and you are the savior of the world god mm. we thank you for enabling pastor to share uh, all of this information we bless the class thank you lord in jesus name we pray amen 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 all right thank you everyone um we've got a little extra time here between break uh, enjoy your break enjoy your next class and have a good day god bless you all see you soon bye